Hello and a very warm welcome to this week's Out and About. Dr. Asim Malhotra is a renowned NHS cardiologist who regularly comments on a wide variety of health topics. And I'm pleased to say that he joins us as this week's special guest to discuss just that. Dr. Asim, thank you so much for joining us once again here on Out and About. We know restrictions are easing here in the UK, but we're not out of the woods just yet. We also know that as an Asian community, we are more at risk of coronavirus. Just explain to our viewers exactly why that is. Yes, for sure. Thank you for having me on. I think the first thing for people to understand and acknowledge is there's almost a double risk just by being South Asian of uh, suffering severe complications from COVID-19, including death. And the reason for that, and that's something I published on in a medical journal called The Physician um, several months ago, is that once you correct for conditions related to excess body fat, so type 2 diabetes, heart disease, etc., there is no other increased risk. So there's no genetic list, risk as such. It's actually all probably related to underlying conditions, which are rooted in uh, poor lifestyle habits and environments as well that people live, grow and work in. So once you correct for all of those, there isn't any other increased risk. So we have to try and identify those root causes of those problems to then offer solutions moving forward so we can help the South Asian community. And this isn't just about COVID-19. Actually, this is something that's been longstanding, uh, Vishal, for a very long time in terms of other conditions and diseases that result in not just premature death, but actually a lot of chronic pain and chronic misery and ill health for many years of people's lives. We had the vaccine minister Nadim Zahawi on the show just a couple of weeks ago, and we talked about some of the skepticism that exists amongst our Asian community around the vaccine. You see many people uh, from our society day in, day out. Why are people so skeptical when we are so at risk? Yes, it's a very good point, Vishal. So vaccine hesitancy or skepticism around the vaccine are based upon both what we call rational fears and irrational fears. Now, some of the irrational fears, unfortunately, have come from, uh, you know, have been generated from, you know, areas of social media, uh, such as, you know, that there's alcohol or pork, for example, in the vaccine, um, or that the vaccine could lead to infertility, or there's some kind of conspiracy theory to, you know, um, try and uh, reduce the, uh, you know, population's uh, fertility rates to reduce you know, the population from increasing and expanding. And these are completely irrational. Um, on the other side of it, you have some rational fears. And those rational fears actually are there, um, you know, uh, for everybody in a way, because what we also realize and what we know more than ever, especially something I've been campaigning on, is there is a great lack of transparency when it comes to the prescription of medications and drugs. And as a result, where we are now, even pre-COVID, is that the, you know, prescribed drugs and prescribed medications um, are the third most common cause of death after heart disease and cancer because of side effects. And the reason that is, is because the drug industry, who have a, you know, a primary motive to produce profit for their shareholders, actually engage in, you know, this is well-documented, criminal activity when it comes to manipulation of research results, hiding data on harms, uh, for example, an illegal marketing of drugs. Is that something that, you know, combined they have, they have you know, paid billions in, in, in fines over the years? And I won't name a specific drug company, but most of the leading drug companies have been part of this. So when you put it all together, it's, un it's easy to understand why there is uh, a skepticism amongst new drugs. Having said that, and, you know, someone that looks at all of the data uh, independently, when it comes to all drugs that are, we've produced that are out there, vaccines are probably the safest drugs by far. So that's the first thing I would, I would reassure people about. The second thing is, and we have good data on that now as well, Vishal, is that the vaccine is efficacious. You know, for me, when the original trials came out, actually, I wasn't concerned about potential harms. I thought that if they are there, they're going to be very, very small, you know, in magnitudes of one in 20,000, one in 100,000, that kind of thing. Every drug has a potential harm, but they're very, very small when it comes to vaccines. I was more concerned about whether they're going to work, how efficacious are they going to be. But we have good quality data now, uh, both from the real world, but also from antibody testing and people that have had the vaccine, even older age groups, um, including, you know, my own father, you know, he's a South Asian origin, he's in his early 70s. Um, and uh, he had the vaccine, the Pfizer vaccine. 
And by chance, he had an antibody test sent to him and it was strongly positive. So I can be reassured that for him, I know that he's now got very strong immunity to COVID-19. Coronavirus aside now, we know that many of our health and lifestyle choices as a community put us more at risk of other conditions. Over the period of lockdown, would you say that trend has got better or worse? It's a really good question, Michelle. I think, unfortunately, we don't have any good evidence that our lifestyle, certainly in the South Asian community or even, you know, in, in the traditional British, you know, and not, uh, Caucasian communities, of actually people improving their lifestyles, unfortunately. Um, I think one thing people need to understand first and foremost is that 90% of the deaths globally that happened from COVID-19 occurred in countries where more than half of the population were overweight or obese. And certainly in the UK, you know, more, more than 60% of the population, adult population are in that category. Um, if you look at it in more detail, and what I research as well, is also looking at genetic differences in people who develop these conditions, such as type 2 diabetes and heart disease. And for South Asians, we develop these conditions, Vishal, at much lower levels of body fat compared to Caucasians. So up to 40% of people from South Asian origin will have levels of body fat that actually increases their risk of conditions like type 2 diabetes and heart disease um, at normal body mass index. Many of people from South Asian communities are at increased risk and don't even know it because they carry that, uh, that fat, that dangerous fat, if you like, which in excess on the body is really a toxin to the body over time. And that makes us our, our immune system less robust but also predisposes conditions, as I've said earlier, the most, you know, most prevalent disturbing statistic, uh, if you like, when it comes to you know, South Asians or even in India, is premature death rates from heart disease and stroke, which you know, affect a significant proportion of, of Indians in India. In, and these are middle-class people. You know, that means dying before the age of 70. And it's estimated that our failure to tackle this, you know, heart disease and stroke in India, premature deaths in India, uh, will cost the Indian economy about, um, you know, uh, two to three trillion, equivalent of two to three trillion US dollars by 2030. So this is a major problem for Indians in India, as well as South Asians here. Let's just talk about diet for a moment here. I'm sure many of our viewers have been eating the same foods week in, week out, probably for several years now. And psychologically, that's a habit that's quite hard to break. I guess when we think about eating healthy, we automatically think that it's going to be food we're not going to enjoy, but you're saying that absolutely is not the case. Absolutely, Vishal. I think the problem is we've got the balance wrong, that we're having sugary treats two to three times a day as opposed to having it maybe once or twice a week. We're filling our plate with a lot more processed, ultra-processed carbohydrates in the form of flour-based, You know, whether it's too many chapatis or whether it's too much rice. What I recommend people to do, uh, you know, of course, they can they can come to my website. I, I publish a lot of this stuff for free to give them advice is, um, you know, go cold turkey for a month, first and foremost. So this isn't restricting these foods forever, but it's trying to break the addiction. A lot of these foods have become addictive, if you like, for people. That, that's why they, they get so used to them. They think, how can I live without these foods? Once you break the addiction, then you change your palate, your taste buds. And then later on, you find you're not craving the foods in the same way and you'll still eat them as the occasional treat, but it won't predominate your diet. And that's the key to doing this. Dr. Asim, that's the physical side of things there. Let's just talk about the psychological side of things for a moment. We know as a community, we are incredibly renowned for being a hardworking community, but quite often that pressure from work can often lead to stress. Just tell us a bit more about psychological stress and how we can really help combat that. Yeah, I think the first thing to say, uh, Vishal, is that when it comes to just general sense of well-being and happiness, the two biggest sources of stress are work and relationships. Okay, so I think if we just start from that background knowledge. So even at the roots of this, when I speak to my, you know, my, uh, my nieces, my nephews, you know, about, you know, what they want to do when they grow up, I think the most important thing we should be telling our kids is do something that you love. It's so important. Do something you love and, if, and that you're good at. You know, the ideal combination is doing something that you love, that you're good at. And, you know, within even Hindu and Buddhist philosophy, you know, we are, we are always, we should always think about helping our community as well. So if you can do something you love, you're good at, and it's also a public service, that's perfect. And just lastly, doctor, what are some of the key, but really simple steps that we can take to ensure that we are absolutely staying on top of our health? I think some very simple things, Vishal, is avoid ultra processed food is the first thing, 
Okay, so go for more nutritious home cooked food, even certain takeaways now, you can get healthy food. But what does that mean? If it comes out of a packet with five or more ingredients, usually with additives or preservatives, usually high in starch, sugar or, or, or unhealthy oils, these are ultra processed foods, but it's more than half of our diet. So we need to just eliminate those from the diet now. Uh, certainly try that for a month first and foremost. That would be one thing I would suggest. Often that will mean you're going to reduce your sugar consumption. About 70% of sugar consumption that is hidden in foods comes from these foods anyway. So I would cut out the sugar as well. That's one thing to, and just go back to more natural home cooked food. Exercise 30 minutes a day, brisk walk. You know, we're getting better weather now as well. There's no excuses, certainly over the summer. Try and get 30 minutes, just get your heart rate up a bit, go out for a walk. Ideally with, you know, we can mix with now up to six people from two different households. So outside. So do it with friends or family as well. Uh, and then just, you know, do what you can to reduce your stress levels. I think deep breathing, you know, start with five to 10 minutes, build it up slowly. Even if your mind's a bit active, it doesn't matter. Just slow your breathing down. I have a technique I use, which is breathing in slowly through the nose for four seconds, holding it for seven, and then breathing out for eight. And do that, you know, repetitively, um, uh, starting for five to 10 minutes and build it up and you will feel more relaxed immediately. And if you do that regularly over a period of time, over the whole day, you will actually feel more relaxed as well. One thing I absolutely love about the things you're recommending here is that they don't have to be drastic changes, but they can be most certainly life-changing. Dr. Asim, thank you so much for coming onto the program and sharing your wisdom with our viewers. Thank you. My pleasure, Vishal. Time for a very short break, but there's much more still to come in part two, so make sure you join us again in a few moments' time.